I'm Adam Block, uh, the Council of Economic Advisors uh, Chair. First, we'll confirm that all members and others anticipated to be on the agenda are present and able to hear me. When I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Um, uh, Tina? Here. Um, Mike Wilcox? Here. Adam Meisner? Here. Glenn? Here. I note for the record uh, a number of people that uh, have advised they're unable to make today. Uh, that includes Stua Egler, uh, Anne-Marie Dowd, Ted Owens, um, David Montgomery, Virginia Fleischer, and Bob Henschel. <laughs> we do anticipate uh, others to, um, uh, to attend, and I'm sure that they'll join in, in progress. I'd also like to uh, uh, note that uh, town staff that are here and able to uh, participate. Uh, firstly, Newman, Director of Planning. Here. Tim McDonald, our uh, Department of uh, Health Director. Tim, are you able to hear us? Present. Yes. Okay. Sorry, can you not hear me? I can now, that's great. I don't know if, you're, uh, if your video is paused or if, you're, if that's just a still photo of you. I guess it must be a slow connection, sorry about that. No problem, thank you very much for, for joining. And then we have others uh, anticipated to be on the agenda. I see uh, two are here already. Uh, Louise Gian uh, Giannakis, if I pronounce that correctly. Close enough. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, Ted Doyle. Hi, everybody. Thanks. And I'm here with Lee as well. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Lee. Thanks very much for, uh, for coming. That's very good. Continue. Um, I, this open meeting of the Needham Council of Economic Advisors is being conducted remotely, uh, consistent with current state regulations, and is being recorded. It is being convened through the Zoom application as posted on the town's website, which spells out how the public may gain access. Some attendees are here via that video conference. Public access does not ensure that there will be public participation unless required by law. This particular meeting will not have public comment. Please also be aware that others may be able to see you. Anything that you share or state will be captured by the recording and become a matter of public record. All supporting materials for this meeting, including the agenda, are available on the town's website, which is needhamma.gov, unless otherwise noted. Some ground rules. The ground rules for this meeting are designed to allow for an accurate public record. I will introduce each of the speakers on our agenda. After they conclude their remarks, each board member will be asked by name for any comment, questions, or motions. For all of us, please mute your phone or device um, uh, uh, when you are not speaking. Uh, and if you have another device with you, please mute that device as well. Please speak clearly and in a way that helps assess, uh, that helps assure accurate minutes. Please wait until recognized by name and please also state your name before speaking. Um, and finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be uh, taken by roll call vote. So those are the ground rules. Um, uh, um, We've had an opportunity to review uh, the minutes of a June 15 meeting. Um, can I have a, uh, a motion uh, to approve those minutes? So moved. Thank you, Glenn. Can I have a second? Motion. Thanks, Adam. Second. Seconded by Adam Meisner. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none, uh, I'll call a vote to approve those minutes. Uh, Mike Wilcox? Yes. Uh, Glenn? Yes. Tina? Yes. And Adam? 
Yes. And I, uh, I uh, as chair, uh, uh, say yes as well. So I declare that the minutes are passed. Um, there has been some changes in what's happening with our uh, um, with the COVID virus uh, in Massachusetts, and now is a perfect time to bring in Tim, uh, if you're able to provide an update uh, on the cases and what's happening, and perhaps a little bit more locally. Sure, happy to. Um, so, uh, I think as many people know, Massachusetts uh, has been seeing an uptick uh, over the last. Uh, you know, two weeks, two and a half weeks. Uh, it's been fairly slow uptick, but uh, the direction is is upward. Um, uh, yesterday, the state reported more than 400 cases. That's not a great sign. Um, the state has unveiled some new sort of pocket messages, including a sort of mask up Massachusetts new videos and PSA. The governor. So, um, I think as many people no put in place um, two, two weeks ago um the tight travel basically saying that unless you're coming back from a state that you would have to clean for 14 days or produce a test before you came back showing that you were uh i think we lost i think we lost tim yeah was, was it hard that he left but was um, it hard to hear him yes i did yes. okay tim we lost we lost you i think you were talking about okay. sorry the, about that i think you were talking about the new uh executive order the travel restriction yep. in massachusetts yes my apologies um so uh the governor did put in a, a travel order about two weeks ago saying that if you were traveling back to massachusetts may state that had a higher level of COVID transmission, you would have to quarantine for 14 days or produce a negative test result uh, prior to 72 hours to come back to Massachusetts. Um, it, recently that has excluded most of New England and Northeast New York, New Jersey. Uh, Rhode Island has also seen an uptick. Governor yesterday said that anyone going to Rhode Island will have to quarantine when they come back. Um, so that's a uh, car. Tim, are you uh, with us? Sorry, largely related to travel. I am. Can you hear me? I'm very sorry. It's a little in and out. I wonder uh, if you should try uh, calling in. Sure, I'm happy to do that. Um, I'm, my apologies. I'll try calling in. Is that okay? Uh, Alex and Claire, yeah. are you guys able to provide Tim with a phone number? Or Tim, do you have a phone number? Uh, I believe I do, yep. I'm sorry about that, folks. I'll call right in. No problem. Thanks, Tim. <clears throat> We're always so reliant on technology, which is great when it works. And when it doesn't, it's a blip. Sometimes frustrating. Tim, is uh, I see a, an icon with a phone. Is that you? No, Adam, it's uh, Rick Potbrush. Oh, very good. I'm glad I checked. Thanks, Rick. I know your attendance at the meeting. Thank you very much. We're just starting. We're in the process of hearing an update from our town director of public health. Who is no, I, I, I'm aware. I, I, I've, been on the, I've been on the call since the beginning, but for some reason, using the one tap, it automatically unmutes you. Or, oh. or mute, it automatically mutes you. So... Uh, and it, it, it comes on automatically if you speak. So that's why I wanted to let you know I was here. Thank you very much. I'm glad that you did because we uh, did not see that you were in spy mode. So now that we've uncovered that mystery, I'll make a note to Emily. <laughs> um, and then I see another person Adam. by phone, 781-883-7421. Uh, Tim, is that you? That is me, yep. Okay, that's actually much better audio. I apologize for the technical problem, and I'm grateful that you returned. 
Yes, I, I'm very sorry about that. So I'll, I'll try to be very brief, uh, considering I've started twice already. Um, so um, Rhode Island was added yesterday to the list of high risk states where an individual must quarantine or produce a negative test result if they come back from Rhode Island to Massachusetts. Um, that's the first time a state in the Northeast has been added to that list. Uh, Rhode Island is experiencing an uptick that's upticking faster than Massachusetts, so neither are in pretty good shape. Um, there have been calls, um, and I think people probably seen them, they, they were sort of headlines in the Globe yesterday, for Governor Baker to consider rolling back uh, the reopening, perhaps a, a step or a phase. In Massachusetts, the, the numbers aren't aren't nearly as bad as they were in April and May uh, and even the beginning of June. Um, but they have been going steadily up. The, the percentage of tests that come back positive have gone up from about 1.7 to 2.2, 2.3. Uh, the total number of cases uh, was in the you know, low hundreds and now is at you know, 400, uh, more than 400 yesterday. So that's a cause for concern. Um, the state has started a number of sort of public education campaigns, uh, including Mask Up Massachusetts, which the governor announced uh, earlier this week uh, with video PSAs, advertising and print and, and uh, TV media and radio. Um, so the state is, is making sort of all the efforts it can to try to reverse the trend of um, a growth in cases without having to roll back a phase in reopening. I think um, the challenge we're seeing is that compliance isn't great. In Needham specifically, we've had uh, an uptick, a small uptick in cases over the last three weeks, three to four weeks, uh, and 80% of them have been travel related. People who've been traveling to other states or other parts of the state for, you know, a fun weekend where maybe they didn't observe sort of proper distancing and weren't maybe as careful as they might have been. Um, so I think the challenge we're running into is Compliance has been good and is slowly sort of fading away. And that's, at least from my perspective, what's resulting in the increased transmission. I'm sure we've all seen coverage of, um, you know, the beach in South Boston, the, the Harbor Cruise. Um, there's been lots of examples where people have not been observing uh, the social distancing and the mask requirement, nor the restriction on the size of outdoor gatherings. Um, the governor has indicated, at least in his call yesterday, that he would uh, consider reducing the the size allowed for gatherings. Um, so that's that's potentially an interesting step. I think from my perspective in Needham Public Health, we get fairly regular complaints, uh, you know, two or three a day from people saying, you know, this uh, restaurant had someone whose mask was not always covering their nose. It was down you know, below their nose. We've had complaints about, um, you know, multi-unit office buildings, some of the tenants not always sort of following mask requirements. And I think we do our best to follow up on those complaints. It's very challenging if we don't actually observe the complaints ourselves to, to really follow up on them. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges Needham is sort of tackling right now is the return to school. Uh, so, you know, Olin College and Babson, which is obviously just across the, the border in Wellesley, will be returning to school. Um, it, it's interesting. Um, you know, thinking about like private schools returning, St. Joe's, um, one senior head ad, St. Sebastian's, and then the Needham public schools. So I'm, I'm involved with the superintendent's uh, advisory group on how to safely reopen Needham's public schools. Uh, the superintendent has a presentation tomorrow night to school committee. Um, I don't think it's um, revealing any secrets to tell you that there is very little appetite uh, for an all in-person option. Um, there is strong interest in a hybrid option where some students would be, you know, attending week one and, and the other half of students would be attending week two. It's dealt with um, with that reduction in the total number of students in the building at this possible safe distance. To sort of double check that, um, one of the things we've done is we've um, worked with the Healthy building, uh, Buildings Group at the Chan School of Public Health at Harvard. Uh, they've done airflow modeling on buses because buses were my largest point of concern uh, in terms of is it safe to have kids on buses? I mean, buses aren't going to get any wider. Is it possible to have adequate distancing? The answer is not quite possible to get the ideal distance, but if you have the windows down and everyone has their masks on, it's a safe environment in terms of um, airflow and particulates and turnover. Um, the Harvard folks are 
uh, kind, been kind enough and are doing modeling at some of our schools in Needham, including some of the older schools. So the, the Pollard, the Mitchell, parts of the high school. Um, Needham has, I think it's everyone on this call knows, done a, a pretty impressive job of building or renovating its schools over the last 20 years. Um, but there are definitely still uh, some schools like the Pollard and the Mitchell that, that for the most part do not have uh, HVAC systems. They, they don't have um, AC. Um, so the concern is about sort of air that is not moving um, and how that uh, affects uh, students and teachers if they're in a, a classroom for a long period of time. So we're hopeful to get the results of the modeling by later this week. Um, and as I mentioned, the school committee is going to talk tomorrow uh, night about that. Um, I don't know if there are other questions. The one thing I wanted to sort of highlight is, um, and it was recommended as part of a Newton Needham Chamber webinar, um, uh, a sign that might help to diffuse potentially some tension between uh, commercial businesses and their customers um, about whether someone is wearing a mask or, excuse me, whether someone is not wearing a mask because of medical reasons. Um, Brookline had a very interesting sign. We talked to Brookline uh, and they were happy to have us borrow it. We made some slight adjustments and um, we sent that out to a number of businesses last week. We have hard copies uh, that just came in if people would like them. Uh, it basically sort of says, you know, if, if you have a medical condition that prohibits you from wearing a mask, we're happy to offer you extra service like curbside, you know, or delivery or something rather than have you come into the store. So it's trying to sort of preempt that maybe challenging uh, interaction where a staff member isn't comfortable because someone isn't wearing a mask or other customers aren't comfortable because someone isn't wearing a mask. Um, I wanted to ask folks, I, I guess I wanted to mention that so hopefully the folks are aware, but I wanted to ask if there are other sort of signs, if there's other ways that the public health department or the town could help businesses um, with signage, with sort of, um, I guess sort of helping with that message. I think what I've heard on these calls and, and on some of the chamber calls is that businesses are very challenged by and concerned about the confrontational interaction with someone who, you know, is maybe trying to make a point by not wearing a, a political point or a philosophical point by not wearing a mask or not wearing a face covering. So if there's hey, other. Hey, Tim. Yep. Yep. Tim, uh, and uh, this is more of a personal question before we get on to that but I'm getting close to the Rhode Island border I'm on my way for a business meeting at a property that I own getting a uh, the sprinkler system tested so I'm going to be down there for a half hour in Coventry Rhode Island and then I'm coming back to Massachusetts based on what you said am I going to be in a in a problematic situation you are not um, so there is exceptions for people who are daily commuters or who are making you know an errand or a trip across the border um, you know, otherwise people in Dartmouth or Westport would have to quarantine repeatedly, I think. Um, it, it is people who stay over, so if you're going on date, they want you to either so basically a day trip. a COVID test. So day trips are okay. Uh, day trip, okay, good, thank you. I was about to turn around. <laughs> no, no, day trips are okay. I think, um, like I said, it's just the challenge of if someone goes on vacation there, which is obviously, you know, up, if people are making vacation plans up until yesterday at noon, it was perfectly fine to go to Rhode Island. And now, you know, they're saying it's not. So I think that obviously makes it challenging for people in terms of you know, deposits on rentals and things like that. I, okay, I, thank you. I'd like to return. I see you know, your, you know, your hand is up um, and I'll, I'm going to call on you in one second. I'd like to return to the question that Tim posed to the group and I don't know, Adam, uh, if, you're, uh, if you're able to comment on your, your clients or your tenants, or Mike, if you're able to, I certainly expect, uh, Tina, you're going to be able to comment on this. Uh, uh, Tim had made a point of uh, asking, is there, are there other signs or things that the Department of Health could do in town that could uh, help ensure compliance? Um, with uh, uh, the precautions that we should all be taking, particularly with business. And I know that, uh, Tina, in the past, you've made a, a comment that it's been very difficult um, to have that uncomfortable conversation sometimes with client with uh, customers that may not be compliant and resist and still perhaps won't uh, exit the property, uh, even if you ask them. So, uh, uh, but I, I turn it over to you, Tina. 
I mean, even just some sort of, it's one thing that's fine to have a sign up, but there are still people who will come in and you actually have to have a nasty conversation with them. So if we could get some, and I, Tim, I think I emailed you about this a while back, even just some talking yep, points that we can just over and over again so we're not getting into this back and forth, you know, why we need to justify what we're doing. Um, it's yeah. not only regarding wearing masks, but it's also, especially as we get into fourth quarter, a lot of our spaces are really small. Um, so um, managing party sizes, you know, I can't have 10 people in the store at one time. Okay. Like last weekend, I had five people in here at one time and it started to feel a little sort of, thankfully the customers that were in here were sort of cognizant of what was going on and, and voluntarily took turns coming in and out. Um, but you know, I, you may have a family, a family of five come in that, that takes your entire capacity, right? So it's the masks, yep. it's sort of party size. I know Volante Farm tried the party size model they got slammed on Yelp, so they had to readjust their way of m managing traffic and just overall safety, okay. you know, using hand sanitizer. I don't want to have to keep telling people. I mean, I shouldn't have to sort of police that over and over again and then get into get to the point where people are getting angry with me. Um, so even if we just there was sort of this consensus across the board that we all have at least talking points that we can just keep repeating over and over and over again. Um, I think so that, you know, when we're caught off guard, we can just, you know, at least I can go to where my employees can go to um, a bullet point sheet and, you know, it's not even a conversation. It's a non-starter. We need to make the, um, the sign that I was mentioning, but we want to make sure we're getting something for everybody. So, okay. So talking points for you know, signage about party size. Um, so how, you know, I've seen two resources where they, you know. Tim, your audio's uh, falling off. We're not catching every word. Oh, um, I'm sorry about that. I, I was just uh, repeating what I thought I heard Tina say to make sure I got it, which was questions about um, talking point or requests for talking points for how to maybe deal with or facilitate a conversation with argumentative customers. Um, messaging or some type of maybe public information campaign to remind people about uh, like if there's four people in your group, maybe only one or two of them need to go into an establishment. They don't all have to go in. Um, were those sort of the two key points, Tina? Yeah, I mean, de obviously wearing masks because we're still, people are still coming in without those. Um, yeah, and you people being hand sanitizer too. Yeah, and we all have it. It's all here. We all have, all of us have hand sanitizer in at least two or three different places. We all have disposable masks people can wear. So it's not even about, oh, I forgot. Well, we can accommodate that. It's the, again, like you said, the philosophical or political side of things. Um, but it's, it's not great to keep having these conversations and then, you know, to read a review about your business that is not favorable because all you're trying to do is keep not only yourself and your staff safe, but the general public. And absolutely. Um, I, Tina, have you found other challenges uh, uh, with the business? You know, being on the retail sector as a result of, you know, coronavirus, you've obviously made it through an initial, you know, the initial period of time, which was such a hurdle. Are you finding the business is starting to return, albeit differently? Yeah, for sure. I mean, and we're sort of navigating. And again, it really is, it has to be this very collaborative effort not only between the store owners, um, store management, but also the people, your, your clients. And thankfully my, you know, I have clients that are very compliant and they're also very concerned about their safety, but certainly there are several other stores around here that have had some real challenges trying to manage the crisis, you know, with their businesses. Um, 
and it, you can put as many signs up as you want, but it's still to have to have these conversations with people at this point, you know, and in, in some, in some cases it gets very contentious. And um, they're down the street, one of the gift stores, a woman threatened to call the police because she felt like her rights were being violated because she wasn't allowed to come in without a mask. So it's kind of like, you know, it's tough enough what we have to deal with at this point. Why do we have to, anything that it can make our lives easier with regards to any sort of confrontation that will help. Glenn, you're also in retail. What's your experience with customers either on the service side or on the purchase side? Um, what are you, how are you finding it or experiencing it with customers? Customers are fine. Everybody's, you know, we've got signs up all over the place. Um, uh, it's rare that a customer comes in without a mask and, and, and we haven't had to have those conversations, fortunately. Um, we do have some politically minded team members that are a challenge, um, but, uh, but not customers. Okay. The good news is those politically minded team members are in a position where they can social distance from everybody else and they don't have any customer contact. So um, we're able to navigate uh, that uh, little problem. And contain it, it sounds like. Yeah. Um, Adam and, uh, and Mike, I'd like to turn it over to you guys uh, and uh, to get a perspective of what, uh, what trends you're seeing and have seen over the last month or two with regard to um, uh, the rental market, you're both in you know very unique sectors. Um, I'll start. Um, activity is picking up, which is is positive. Um, people are coming out and looking at space, which you know during March and April there was basically zero in the way of tours. Um, not seeing a lot. I've seen a few Boston-based tenants looking, um, you know, particularly in the Needham-Newton area. Um, tenants are that have leases expiring um, are looking to contract in many cases, it seems. Um, a couple of tenants that we had paperwork out to renew leases uh, decided not to go forward with them. I mean, these are deals that basically were teed up to be signed. And we've lost, um, you know, we had a co-working group over at 75 Second um, that basically had two locations that they decided to consolidate into, into one. I will also share with you, um, you know, Boston Properties is a publicly traded company, so they put a lot of their information um, in the public realm in that regard. And um, I read something last week where they have 5 million square feet in the Waltham market and they basically calculate their census as they put it at about 8%. So people um, are not really coming back to most of the office buildings. And you know, in the suburbs, it's not about mass transit, it's not about elevators. Um, they've just chosen to continue and obviously their employers are encouraging uh, that they continue to work from home. So that's a trend that I think we need to really keep an eye on uh, as it relates to um, office demand and um, you know my own personal opinion is as we get into the colder darker months people um, I think are, are really going to want to be reconnected with co-workers and whatnot but you know obviously they're not going to do that until they feel it's a safe environment uh, right now in the summer months I think it's a little bit easier to uh, and more beneficial quite honestly to, to work from home so Tim, uh, I, is there a requirement uh, in the current phase uh, of capacity in, a, in an office building or in an office suite by square footage or number of people? There, there are. Um, you know, most of the time when you're looking at gathering size, it's in the context of, um, you know, a commercial establishment like a, a rental hall or a function facility or something like that. There are restrictions on on office size in some instances, um, but it really gets down to sort of how much separation there is. Um, and there's not a, a mechanism or a, an easily identifiable mechanism for someone to regulate that. So it's not, um, for example, my staff and I are not going into TripAdvisor and, and with tape measures. Um, so it, it, it really is largely up to the employer. There's a, 
complaint function for the Department of Labor Standards at the state that can uh, take complaints from employees or people who observe what they think are unsafe conditions. But, but that's sort of the extent of it. Mike, are you finding any requests for tenant improvements? And this, Adam, also goes to you uh, for any potential new tenants looking uh, to create space either um, you know, where uh, typically would be a bullpen with a large number of employees and a cubicle uh, where they're looking to redesign and ask for more in TI as a result of an increased expense to separate employees? I would say there's certainly more requests and um, searching um, for space that has hardwall offices. Um, and that obviously from a landlord's point of view is more costly than putting people in workstations, which the tenants themselves, you know, supply. Um, but uh, Adam, I, I leave it to you to give your opinion. Yeah, I mean, I'd say it's being talked about more. Um, I think, you know, the deals that I'm working on right now, just coincidentally, just by, you know, how they've operated in the past are all, you know, office heavy anyways. So it's a, you know, an advertising company that needs all offices because that's how they've all, always operated. And then a couple of financial services, they have, you know, that kind of setup as well. Um, but it's certainly been like, we've had a lot of activity in terms of touring at, at a lot of the buildings and people tend to gravitate more towards the suites that we have that are fully built out, meaning have a lot more offices than open space. Um, I don't feel like they've been on the request for proposals asking for more than than the norm, but I think it just also depends on you know the current state of the actual suite itself. So, but I mean it does feel safer, even though you know the air conditioning units in a suite are you know the air is shared. Um, it's just having that wall as as a as another um, barrier is, you know makes people a little bit more comfortable. So. And Adam, are you able to speak to any trends that you're seeing with uh, your real estate business? And are you uh, specifically, are you finding any other Boston-based businesses picking up interest or signing more leases for suburban space, although perhaps keeping some space in Boston? Yeah, so I haven't seen that many tours actually happening. Um, we had one the other day for a law firm coming out of the city that's looking to have a satellite location for some of their executives that live out in, in the Western suburbs here. Um, I've been receiving more calls from downtown brokers inquiring about availabilities and everything, but the tour volume from that point of view hasn't really increased that much. Um, I will say though that, you know, tour volume just in general for businesses that are in the Newton, Needham, Waltham, Wellesley area has really picked up substantially, you know, as of June one, basically. Um, and, you know, March to, to the end of May was absolutely dead. Hardly any transactions were negotiated or signed. Um, and then in the last, you know, eight weeks or so, it's, it's, it's been very different. Um, I'd say a couple of groups rising. One group was opening a new, it was just, you know, new location in, in New England for, for them, um, this company. Um, and then just, you know, a few others looking for a change of scenery, um, maybe to upgrade their building a little bit because they weren't, you know, comfortable with the current, you know, systems of, of an older building. Um, and then a bunch of renewals as well, you know, more short term because people want to try to, you know, hedge their risk and see, you know, where this thing goes over the next 12 months before they commit to taking on less space or, or more space. So. Lastly, Adam and, and uh, um, Mike, are you seeing an increase in, uh, in vacancy or vacancies staying about the same as they have been? We've been putting um, more... You know, these two deals that we lost um, are now being marketed as available. And as I said, we're talking to some tenants who want to renew, but they want less space, which means, you know, we have to partition their space and market the residual space. Um, I know Adam probably has his... Um, a handle on the market, but Boston in particular has been heavily hit by uh, sublease. I've heard upwards of two and a half million square feet or so that has been put on the market. In the suburbs, I think it's less than a million, um, and that constitutes a pretty significant amount of uh, geography, you know, basically uh, 128, et cetera. So it's not as um, heavily impacted, but um, 
there is going to be more space and um you know it's probably not unrealistic to think that there may be softening in conditions as more space comes on and landlords get more aggressive to uh to fill that space yeah we've definitely seen an uptick in, in terms of subleasing um it, people have to remember it's just because there's a pandemic and people want to downsize they can't just you know walk away from their lease so it's not being put on you know on a direct basis it's you know through subleases and I think that'll continue to happen, but it's not nearly as bad, like Mike said, as, as downtown Boston, where you know, there's just been millions of square feet being dumped onto the market, uh, which is scary. I should actually, um, Adam, point out, last week we did, the Chamber did a, uh, a webinar, I was one of the panelists on it, um, and it was recorded talking about the market. We had uh, someone from Linear Retail, we had a retail broker on there as well, and then myself talking about the different sectors uh, ran for about an hour, maybe a couple minutes beyond that. Uh, I'll try to get that link and circulate it to the group if anyone's interested in, you know, watching what what everybody had to say. If uh, first of all, that's great. I'm glad that you mentioned that because I was hoping that Glenn would be able to make it to the conversation this week to be able to talk that through. I think it would be helpful for all of us to take a look at it and get a clearer picture of what's actually happening in real estate across the sectors. Uh, if you could send that to me and Alex uh, Klee, that would be helpful. If you send it to the group, it may be a conflict of the, or a violation of the open meeting laws, one of the people okay. and so on. So there's a way to process to properly handle that. If you could send that link to me and Alex, we'll arrange to distribute it. Uh, that would be helpful. I'd like sure. to uh, take this moment. Uh, we're about to run into a presentation, but before we do, I would like to take a moment to turn this over to Lee and just update us with any new business permits that have been issued and to be able to do our hiring of uh, the economic development manager, which I'm so excited for. Okay, so I'll start with the um, economic development um, uh, director. We, the town has hired somebody that's going to start um, on, I think on August uh, 24th. Her name is Amy Haleson. And she's currently the executive director um, in in Dedham of Dedham of, De of the Dedham Square um, nonprofit. So we're pleased to um, add her to our staff, and she will begin work on August 24th, and she'll be servicing this um, this um, board. Um, in terms of uh, business permits, the planning board hasn't issued any business permits since we last convened. Um, we've been processing now three individual residential subdivisions. Um, there is some business activity though present. Uh, Children's Hospital has contacted the, the department and I think they're gonna be proceeding with their permitting and I'm in the process of scheduling a, 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 a town um, uh, development review meeting for the end of the month with Children's uh, to review their initial permitting package. Um, and then I think later on in this meeting, you're gonna be um, hearing about a proposed rezoning um, uh, proposal in Avery Square. Um, which would facilitate the redevelopment of the Carter building. Um, and the public hearing on that zoning change is actually scheduled for um, next week, Tuesday. Um, and the zoning change that would implement the redevelopment proposal that you're gonna hear about shortly um, would be voted on at the October um, special town meeting. Thank you very much, Lee. I appreciate the update. Uh, and now uh, it's 9.45 and uh, we have scheduled a presentation uh, LCB Senior Living to uh, talk about their proposal to redevelop 100 uh, West Street, the former Carter building that Lee just referenced. And at this time, I'd like to uh, turn it over to um, to Ted Doyle um, and uh, any of his compadres uh, uh, to participate. Uh, I think you should have the ability to share your screen if you'd like. Um, and uh, if there are others that you'd like to participate that uh, maybe as an attendee, I see we have an attendee with um, a phone number of 603-315-1288. Uh, I don't know if that person is uh, among your group or not, but- uh, Yes. Yes, Adam, thank you so much. Thank you, members of, uh, of, of the group. We really appreciate the opportunity to uh, meet with you today. I'm here with Lee Bloom, my colleague. I'm Ted Doyle. Uh, we have Louise uh, Giannakis, who's with us from Well Tower, uh, representing Well Tower. Well Tower is our partner in this deal and the current owner of the Carter Building. And also Mark Fugier, 
who performed our, our economic impact study, and he's here to talk to us a little bit, or talk to you a little bit about that. Yeah, he's the 603 number, uh, Adam. Thank you very much. So um, LCB is a company with roots that go back about 25 years developing senior housing in, in New England and down the eastern seaboard. Our, our former iteration was Newton Senior Living, which resided and grew at Wells Park uh, through the 90s and the 2000s. Uh, our current uh, offices are in, in Norwood. Uh, we specialize in building assisted and independent and, and memory care living. Our, our product tends to be in beautiful communities like Needham, um, places like Hingham, Ipswich, Darien, Connecticut, Westport, Connecticut. Um, we really appreciate this location for a number of different reasons. Um, we are proposing to redevelop the Carter building to uh, include 72 apartments for independent living, 55 apartments for assisted living and 28 apartments for memory care living. Um, that would include a, a number of different amenities for the residents of the building, um, including a swimming pool that would be indoors, a number of common areas, a movie theater, common dining uh, facilities. Uh, we were proposing to put a, a deck on the roof that the residents can use for their enjoyment. Um, and essentially the, the building will be completely refurbished, uh, re-landscaped, the only change being uh, the addition of, of approximately 10 apartments on the roof of the building, um, which would take up no more than about 35% of that space and would be situated on the back end of the building so as not to be obtrusive on Highland Avenue um, and, and, and be, become a, a, an amenity to the building that we think is really important and would be positive. Um, we, uh, I think at this point, probably turn things over to Mark to give you a high level uh, overview of the economic impacts that we foresee with this property. We didn't want to go on too long. If you have any further questions about LCB or what we're doing in the building or proposing to do, we'd be happy to answer those questions. But Mark, do you want to take over right now? Sure, thank you. Um, good morning and thank you for giving us the opportunity to uh, spend a few minutes with you. Uh, my name is Mark Bougier with Bougier Planning Development. I wrote the fiscal impact report analysis uh, for the proposed development. Um, that type of analysis looks at um, potential revenue to the community uh, from this new use, um, but then also looks at uh, potential impacts to specific departments and then tries to uh, assign a cost to that. Um, on the revenue side, uh, we looked at uh, four different areas of, of revenue. Uh, the, the largest being obviously the property tax uh, that's going to be generated from the redevelopment. Uh, we looked at the local market. I talked with the assessing officials in the community. Obviously, uh, LCB is going to be spending a significant amount of money um, redeveloping and rebuilding this, uh, this existing building, rehabbing it. And we're projecting, um, based on that, that the, uh, the assessment is going to increase to uh, some $37 million will generate $470,000 uh, in property taxes. Um, also, um, income that will be derived is from uh, personal property taxes from the assets that exist in the building, uh, excise taxes for those who still have cars, the independent uh, residents will have uh, vehicles and will be mobile. Uh, so that totals uh, $540,000 when you add in the $29,000 estimated personal property taxes and 21,000 in excise taxes. Um, another revenue generation, although not significant, is the CPA surcharge, which is a 2% surcharge they has for the Community Preservation Act uh, funds, which is approximately $9,400. So additional revenue or revenue to the community, we're estimating to be $555,958 to the community annually. Um, based on this type of use, um, we honed in on departments that we felt were uh, going to see the most direct impact. Not surprisingly, with this type of use, there aren't going to be any school impacts, but police and fire will see the main impacts um, from this use from, from additional calls uh, to the facility, uh, especially the fire department. Um, we sat down with both the uh, police chief and the fire chief to discuss the impacts. Um, one of the ways we measure impacts um, is looking at uh, a key metric, which is calls to the facility. Um, this used to be a, um, a nursing home and, a, and an office building, so we backed those out and estimated new calls to this um, facility. I went over those uh, with both the chiefs, uh, both chiefs, and estimated um, uh, 
costs of uh, additional costs for the police department of fifty thousand dollars, which is about half a, a police office salary, and one hundred eleven thousand uh, dollars for a staff person at the uh, fire department. Um, we also assigned a thousand dollars for Port of Health costs. There will be some inspections uh, given the kitchens and some other facilities at the at the site. Um, so our expected costs are estimates total to approximately $162,000 a year, uh, but generating a net positive uh, impact to the community of $380,000 a year um, to the town. Um, there also will be additional spinoff um, benefits of having uh, new employees in the community, uh, their salaries. Uh, there'll be a lot of, uh, obviously, purchases that will be need to be made uh, for supplies and, and landscaping, et cetera, that is $17 million a year. So there will be some you know, additional spinoff economically uh, from this use uh, to take this vacant building and get it active again and occupied. So overall, um, I believe that this is a very positive fiscal uh, uh, project for the community and economically as well. I'd be happy to answer any questions that anybody might have. Can't hear you, Adam. You're, you're muted. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for the uh, for the presentation. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to open this up to uh, the rest of our members uh, on the council if anybody has any questions. Yeah, I have a question. You, you said it, uh, and the connection was a little poor when, when you mentioned it. What did you say was going up on the rooftop? Uh, 10 apartments. Uh, ah, uh, okay. And also we want to create a rooftop um, space for people to to be able to sit outside and enjoy the, the view and so forth. And Thank you. By that, Ted, you mean a, a common area? Yes. That common area will be for the assisted living folks. The building's segregated into really three sections. Memory care is a secure unit. Uh, and, and we have the assisted living section. They have their own dining space and common space. And then the independent has their own dining space and common areas. There's a few programmatic things that will cause some transition from one side to the other. But on the roof, uh, the 35% we're talking about is predominantly the 10 units, and they have their own terraces, plus the small terrace for the independent folks. And then on the other side, closer to West Street, they were developed or proposing to develop a common space for the assisted living, uh, all of which fits in the 35%. And that's where the planning board really focused on setbacks and view perspectives. Um, and that's what we're going to move forward with. Very good. Uh, uh, does anybody else in the council have any other questions about the project? I note that this is a, um, uh, actually, if I, if I could make a request, uh, Ted, are you able to stop sharing? Oh, yeah. Screens, that way you kind of will use your access and seeing everybody else. Uh, trying to stop. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Thank you very much. So, um, uh, I note that this is a similar, not exact use to what had been there previously. And uh, um, I think the traffic, uh, the tr <coughs> excuse me, uh, not COVID sneeze. Uh, I, uh, I understand that uh, the traffic uh, is expected to be less than the previous use. And certainly the planning board in its own authority uh, will be conducting the, uh, the public hearing next week, uh, you know, will be a forum for the uh, greater public to participate with any questions and so on and to hear a little bit more about the presentation. Uh, I, I note that this is, uh, you know, a pretty robust use of the space which is great uh, and provides a value add service, which has obviously been lacking and clearly in demand. Um, and uh, you know, we look forward to the application proceeding and, and, um, uh, and also through the October uh, town meeting and having any zoning change, hopefully that's uh, um, successful. Um, at this moment, uh, I'd like actually uh, uh, to take a vote um, by the council members uh, in support of uh, the application. 
uh, and then I would probably write a letter uh, to the um, uh, select board to advise them of uh, the outcome of this vote. Uh, I do know that we don't have the full council uh, this particular meeting, uh, but nevertheless, we can pursue it uh, for now. So uh, uh, can I have a motion uh, uh, to approve the proposal by LCB for the redevelopment of 100 West Street, known as the Carter Building. So moved. Thank you, Glenn, and can I have a second? Second. Thank you, Adam. And uh, with that, I'll call the roll. Uh, Glenn? Yes. Very good. Uh, Tina? Yes. Mike? Yes. Adam? Yes. Rick. Yes. And uh, I am a yes as well. I didn't actually call for any discussion. I should probably ask if there's any discussion on the, on the uh, uh, before we took the vote, but hearing the vote, we apparently have no discussion and it passes unanimously. Uh, I'm grateful for, uh, for Lee and Ted and, uh, and Louise for being available and being on the call and for presenting to the council. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, and uh, we wish you great success with uh, um, your endeavor. Uh, is there any other business that any other member has before the council? I don't see anything. At this point, I would uh, just mention to look out for a meeting invite for September. Um, uh, you know, and, and note that, uh, you know, we're now all as parents moving towards this uh, weird scenario of trying to accumulate some kind of uh, additional resources at home if we're able, because this one week on, one week off, which is what we think the school will advance with as a um, uh, way forward initially is gonna present some challenges to employers and uh, us as employees. Um, so I expect a good meeting uh, in September as well to follow and by that time we'll have had Amy, our new economic development manager, which I'm looking forward to welcoming uh, to the council as well. Um, seeing that there's no other business, I'd like to uh, request uh, a motion to adjourn the meeting. Moved. Thank you, Mike. And may I have a second? Second. Very good, Rick. Any discussion? Hearing none, uh, I'll call the roll. Glenn? Yes. Mike? Yes. No? Yes. Rick? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Uh, I declare the meeting adjourned. Thank you all very much for participating today and uh, keep healthy and safe, everybody. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank, you. Really Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.